Um, welcome to uh, today's talk. My name's Professor Ben Carrington. I'm based in the sociology department and I'm chair of the Search in Women's and Gender Studies, which is why we're all here today. Um, I'll keep my introductions brief. The speaker will speak for about 45 minutes and then I will chair a Q&A where you can ask uh, your questions. So I'm delighted to introduce today's speaker, who's worked for many years now, has been gender set in, uh, truly uh, gender set in, in bringing together sociology, cultural studies and American studies in relation to questions around uh, gender and sexuality and race. Uh, Jane Ward is an Associate Professor of Gender and Sexuality Studies at the University of California, Riverside, and she's also the Vice Chair of the Department of Gender and Sexuality Studies. Professor Ward's research focuses on an impressively broad range of topics for gender and sexuality studies scholars, including feminist pornography, queer parenting, transgender relationships, the corporatization of gay pride festivals, the racial politics of same-sex marriage, and the social construction of heterosexuality and whiteness. In addition to numerous essays, book chapters, and um, uh, articles, many of which have been reprinted in anthropologies, she has published two groundbreaking monographs and is currently working on her third. Her first book, Respectably Queer, Diversity Culture in LGBT Activist Organisations, was published in 2008 to great acclaim and was described by the Progress, uh, Progressive magazine as the best book of 2008. Last year, as many of you know, Professor Ward published her second book, Not Gay, Sex Between Straight White Men, which helped to cement her position as one of the leading public intellectuals currently writing on questions of sexuality and race. If you remember reading an article recently on heterosexuality and straight men's same-sex sex lives in either Newsweek, Forbes, The Guardian, Salon of Vice, or if you happen to see a discussion on the topic at the Huffington Post, then you are reading and listening to Professor Ward's work. Not content to simply write out the success of Not Gay for the next decade or more, as most senior scholars might be tempted to do, Professor Ward is already working on her next monograph, provisionally and intriguingly entitled The Failure of Heterosexuality, How Sexism Doomed the, uh, the, How Sexism Doomed the World's Most Cherished Union and Hid the Wreckage. I would have a list of colleagues I want to send that book to. <laughs> Amongst her many acts of public intellectual work, she's also the co-founder, along with the sociologists CJ Pascal and Tay Meadow, of the social science blog socialinquiry.com a clever queer theory play on words that sounds, that reads much better in print than it does when I try to say it. For those scholars in the room who have discovered the 21st century, you can also follow Professor Ward on Twitter, at the Queer Jane, and I would strongly encourage you to do so. I can confirm, given her tweet earlier in the week, that we have all complied with her request and we have left our guns at home for today's talk. Today's talk is entitled, Not Gay, the Homosexual Ingredient in the Making of Straight White Men. Please give me, uh, help me in giving Professor Ward a warm welcome. Thank you. Live tweets. So if, if uh, you want to tweet out um, from today's talk, please feel free. And um, thank you so much um, for coming here today. And thank you to the Center for Women and Gender Studies for the invitation and to Ben Carrington for that fabulous introduction. So um, I am going to be talking today about my recent research on sexual contact between straight identified white men. Uh, but first I want to situate this project as one example of my broader interest in the emergent field of critical heterosexuality studies or critical straightness studies. So um, critical straightness studies is a subfield of sexuality studies that investigates straightness as a cultural, historical, socioeconomic, and ethno-racial formation. And I'm guessing that several of you here might not have spent a lot of time investigating straightness through a queer lens. So um, I'm going to give you some brief background about the theoretical foundations of critical straightness studies to help contextualize the kind of work that I do and 
and how I came to this project. So in the early 90s, um, queer theory began to turn away from lesbian and gay identity as the primary unit of analysis and instead placed normativity or what Michael Warner called regimes of the normal under the analytic spotlight. And so with this shift, queerness itself um, became almost untethered from homosexual sex practices and instead it was defined as resistance to regimes of the normal. So the Queer Studies Project has really become um, twofold, defining what are these regimes of the normal and, what, and, and secondly, what does it mean to resist them? How is it that queer, queer um, critique and queer people resist regimes of the normal? And so this turn toward normativity and away from homosexuals or homosexual sex um, and this work to define and redefine the meaning of queerness begins to significantly just blow up, widen the field of people and practices that we might call queer and that are examined um, within queer studies. And this includes, of course, <coughs> people engaged in heterosexual sex practices who are nonetheless violating gender and sexual norms in some kind of way. So this could mean um, kink, it could mean non-monogamy, it could mean um, intergenerational sex, it could mean um, engagement in sex practices like the down low that push back on binary understandings of sexuality. And so it's, it's in this context that queer studies begins to take up the heterosexual or heterosexuality or straightness um, as, as uh, uh, something that we might examine um, uh, under this queer umbrella. And of course, queer studies in doing this is very much building on the work of critical race scholars investigating whiteness and feminist, scholar, uh, feminist uh, investigations of masculinity. So it's following in that kind of trajectory. And so the whole point here is that is to shift the analytic gaze away from the already hyper-surveilled queer person or queer sex practices and instead put heterosexuality or what we call straightness under the microscope. So this is the context in which I, a feminist dyke, come to write about straight white men and their um, sexual contact with one another's genitals and anuses. And so um, when this book got a lot of media attention, um, journalists asked me over and over again, why are you a lesbian writing this book? It was unfathomable to them. So I thought I'd answer that question for you. So um, about little, a quick story, about 15 years ago, I had dinner with a straight white male friend of mine who had a couple of glasses of wine and sheepishly agreed to tell me some stories about his experiences in a fraternity at a uh, university in Southern California from back when he was in school. And he told me about a fairly elaborate hazing ritual, which um, he said was called the Elephant Walk, and which turns out to um, have been uh, now well documented by sociologists and anthropologists um, who study uh, um, group practices and hazing and, and sexuality within hazing. Um, the, the common elements of the hazing walk, or the hazing walk, of the elephant walk, are that participants strip naked and they stand in a circular formation with one thumb typically um, in their mouth and one thumb in the anus of the young man in front mm -hmm. of them. Uh, in other iterations, they have um, one hand on the penis of the person in front of them. Sometimes they're holding hands between legs, which appears to be the case in this photo. This is a photo of the elephant walk, of an elephant walk that someone documented at uh, Indiana University in the 1970s. So the central component of this hazing ritual is that young men, like circus elephants connected tail to trunk, are um, required to walk slowly in a, in a circle um, linked to one another while their fraternity brothers watch and cheer. Now, as a young feminist hearing about this story, about this initiation ritual, I was at first repelled by the heteromasculine culture of 
grossness and aggression in which I believed that this was embedded. And yet, even at the time, the emerging queer critic and pervert in me um, was really impressed by the imagination required to manufacture a scenario like the, to think this up. And um, I was fascinated by the rules that structured the game and the very performative and ritualistic way that uh, straight men were touching one another's bodies or ordering one another to do so. And I also sensed that as these young men groped one another, they believed they were doing something productive, some, something fundamentally heterosexual, masculine, and white. So consider, for instance, this quote from a currently popular website by and for young men in fraternities, which explains the elephant walk this way. The heavier the hazing, the stronger the bros. By doing things like forcing your pledges to eat human shit or to do an elephant walk, you're basically saying, hey, by learning what your fellow bros shit tastes like, you will be better bros. And I have to say, I really respect that. <laughs> war builds amazing bonds, and hazing is basically war. One thing is for sure, bros would be nowhere without hazing. So this project is the culmination of a question that I've been thinking about for years, which is what does, what does homosexual activity accomplish when it's presumably happening outside of an identitarian framework? What does it accomplish when it's delinked from gay and lesbian identity or gay and lesbian culture? Is it in fact possible, as this bro suggests to us, that straight white men would be nowhere without opportunities to touch one another's anuses and genitals? So what I'm going to argue in this talk today is that to the extent that sex between straight white men is acknowledged in the broader culture, the narratives that circulate around these practices illustrate that they're not gay in their identitarian consequences, um, but that instead they're about building um, heterosexual men, about strengthening heteromasculine bonds, and about strengthening the bonds of white manhood in particular. That these are the stories that participants themselves are telling about why they're touching one another this way. And I am not going to argue against that premise. In fact, I'm going to amplify that premise um, by suggesting that homosexuality is an often invisible but nonetheless central ingredient, a vital ingredient of heterosexual masculinity. Um, so taking sexual contact between straight white men as my point of departure, my aim in this project is to offer a new way to think about heterosexual subjectivity not as the opposite or the absence of homosexuality, but as its own unique mode of engaging homosexual sex, a mode that is characterized by pretense, by heteronormative investments, and by disidentification with queerness. Uh, in particular, I'm going to argue that when straight white men approach homosexual sex in the quote-unquote right way, when they make a show of enduring it, imposing it, repudiating it, that it functions to bolster not only their heterosexuality, but also their masculinity and whiteness. So that's the argument that I'm going to be making. I forgot to give the all too important trigger warning before I started speaking, so I'm sorry, I apologize if you have already been triggered. But um, I am going to be showing many um, photos of nude bodies and sex-like and sexual practices. So while we focus on white men, um, what I argue in, in this book is that all sex practices are embedded within gendered and racialized circuits of meaning. So, for instance, as Chris Ingraham, the sociologist Chris Ingraham, argues in her book, White Weddings, the whiteness of weddings is not simply a matter of white bridal, ground, bridal gowns, but it's also a description of the white women who appear disproportionately in bridal magazines, of the um, white bridal-themed Barbies, and of the racial hierarchy in the wedding industry itself. Ingraham demonstrates that idealized white femininity is central to the construction of weddings as special and perfect in the United States, 
and then the wedding industry in turn uh, reinforces the normalcy and legitimacy of whiteness through the celebration of the wedding. So similarly, my study is asking, what does whiteness do for white heterosexual men when they come into homosexual contact? And what does homosexual contact do for white heteromasculinity? And the reason that this is important is because much attention has been paid to the ways that race cross-cuts the sex practices of men of color, especially straight identified men of color who have sex with men and are referred to in the US context anyway as being on the down low. Many accounts, both um, academic and journalistic accounts of the down low suggest that straight identified men of color who have sex with men are doing so because they are actually gay uh, but cannot come out of the closet due to elevated levels of homophobia in their racial ethnic communities. And I'm going to return to that story later in the talk, but for now I raise it to point out that, in contrast, the links between whiteness and white male sexual fluidity um, have been completely ignored, as if white men's sex practices have absolutely nothing to do with their racial or cultural location. And that's true of sex research generally, that when white people engage in a sex practice, no one ever asks, what's going on in white culture that would lead white people to touch each other that way? Um, even though it's an incredibly productive question to ask. So by focusing on straight white men, I want to think about the ways that whiteness and masculinity as a particular nexus of power enable certain kinds of sexual contact, sexual border crossing, sexual mobility, that are not possible for men of color, and frankly, uh, for women, and um, or they at least don't carry the same kinds of cultural meanings. There's a whole other set of narratives that circulate, circulate around it. So to clarify, especially for the sociologists in the room, um, this is not a generalizable sexological study of white men's sex practices. Instead, I'm interested in how straight white men's homosexual encounters are imagined and justified in um, US culture. So I ask, how have psychologists, sexologists, sociologists, reporters, filmmakers, military officials, and school administrators, and everyday people made sense of the rigidity or the fluidity of straight white men's sexuality? And how have those understandings evolved over time? Because I look at um, uh, the early 20th century forward. So this project is a critical investigation into the stories that people tell to explain why and how straight white men might behave homosexually. And in my talk today, I'm going to trace these narratives across three sites. So we're going to take a tour through three sites, United States military, online personal ads, and representations in popular culture. First, we need a sip of water. Okay, before we begin this tour through the three sites, though, I want to um, locate this project very quickly in relation to contemporary discourses on sexual fluidity and heterosexual fluidity more specifically. Um, raise your hand if you're familiar with the term heteroflexible. Raise your hand if you have never heard that word before. Okay, a few. Maybe some of you are embarrassed to say that you do or don't know that word. Um, so I'm going to offer you um, the very, very scientific and reliable definition from um, the very scientific website, UrbanDictionary.com, uh, that has received over 11,000 votes of approval by its users. And that definition is, quote, I'm straight, but shit happens. Uh, in the last decade, this notion that one could be straight identified and also freely acknowledge that shit happens has sparked the interest of numerous um, uh, reporters and sociologists who have described heteroflexibility uh, as largely a new trend, one popular primarily on, among young women. And much of the commentary on heteroflexibility suggests that this 
marks the arrival of a new and surprising sexual order, um, one that's ushered in by young people with their newfangled ideas about, about sexuality. So in this vein, um, sociologist Lori Essig, blogging for Salon.com in 2000, described her irritation when she my reaction was predictable. How could these kids go and invent yet another identity when we solved that problem for them in the 80s and 90s? <laughs> and then my middle-aged rage mellowed enough to see the true genius behind this term. The opposite of heteroflexible is hetero-rigid. Imagine to say, saying to someone you're hetero-rigid. Sounds awful, right? <laughs> So Essek places emphasis on heteroflexibility as a youth phenomenon, phenomenon. Um, but most accounts have actually focused on the gender or sex of sexual fluidity, which in nearly every case uh, is presumed to be female. So um, <clears throat> sociologists uh, or, or feminists, Lila Roof is a historian and Roberta Taylor is a sociologist, both feminist scholars, have argued that college-age women are, quote, using the heterosexual hookup culture of college to experiment with same-sex sexual interactions. And they go on to say, quote, men do not, at least in contemporary American culture, experience the same kind of fluidity. Although they may identify as straight and have sex with other men, they certainly don't make out at parties for the pleasure of women, end quote. Um, adding to this, this notion that young women are more sexually fluid than men received a significant boost in 2009 with the publication of psychologist Lisa Diamond's book, Sexual Fluidity. Uh, and in this book, Diamond argues that in contrast with men, women spend more time um, in what uh, evolutionary psychologists apparently call um, receptive arousal or uh, responsiveness to non-hormonal, non-instinctive, non-instinctive um, emotional cues. Um, whereas men are spending more time, according to Diamond, in proceptive arousal, which is this just sort of, you don't even need a trigger, you just have this sort of internal um, force of desire that kind of springs forward because you're kind of hardwired to have that. And so um, according to Diamond, women on the other hand can watch a romantic movie or bond with a friend or, you know, all of that and um, that, that, can, that can stimulate them sexually. So according to Lisa Diamond, the point here is that women have a leg up, so to speak, when it comes to sexual fluidity because um, our arousal according to this model, is less um, subject to a fixed hormonal or biological imperative. Okay, so the problem here is that this now common perception that women are more sexually receptive and flexible, and that men, by contrast, are more sexually rigid, has rendered men's sexual fluidity largely invisible. It's like we can't, we can't even see it. Um, scholars like Diamond and Rupin Taylor have described male sexuality and its rigidity as a foil to female sexuality and its fluidity, but they've done so without actually researching men. Um, in fact, when we look at studies of male sexuality, we find that young straight men engage in virtually the same heteroflexible hetero behaviors that young straight women do, although this research um, receives far less attention. So, for instance, sociologist Eric Anderson's study of young men in sports is a gold mine of information about straight college age men kissing, taking body shots off of one another, and engaging in threesomes with girls and male teammates. And here are some quotes from his work. Um, these are straight white male football players in the US that he interviewed. I'm not attracted to them, meaning men. It just it's just that there has to be something worth it. Like this one girl said she'd fuck us if we both made out. So the ends justified the means. We call it a good cause. There has to be a good cause. <laughs> really redefining the meaning of the good cause. <laughs> another explained, there's got to be a reward. If I have to kiss another guy in order to fuck a chick, then yeah, it's worth it. Well, for the most part, it would be about getting it on with her. But like, we might do some stuff together, too. It depends on <laughs> so the important thing here is that these narratives are virtually in distinguishable from young straight women's narratives about homosexual contact in the service of heterosexuality. You have a straight identified person who's engaging in a homosexual encounter for the pleasure of another straight person's 
um, uh, for, for a street spectator uh, of the opposite sex. <clears throat> to the extent that the U.S. media has acknowledged straight male sexual fluidity, it has, as I already mentioned, focused disproportionately on black and Latino men. Men who have wives or girlfriends, who are invested in heterosexual culture, who have no desire to identify as gay or bisexual, and who occasionally have sex with men. However, in these accounts, men of color are not granted the sexual fluidity and complexity that scholars like Diamond and Ruben Taylor extend to women. Instead, their sexual practices are understood almost entirely through the lens of race, with the common argument being that high levels of homophobia in African American and um, Latino communities have forced these men, who would otherwise be honest about who they truly are, to live closeted, dishonest lives. So the point then is this, why this investment in telling a different story about women's sexuality than we tell about men's? And why is race invisible in narratives about the complexities of white people's sexuality? So in bringing these two concerns together, my aim is to place the spotlight on how whiteness and masculinity converge to make homosexual encounters possible for straight white men while at the same time preserving straight white men's racial and sexual normalcy, which is a big part of um, what I want to emphasize. So let's start our tour mm -hmm. um, through the three sites that I mentioned previously. So examples of the ritualized deployment of homosexual contact in military initiation and training are numerous. Perhaps the most noted example is the US Navy's crossing the line ceremony. According to, um, and this is an image of crossing the line from the 1960s, um, don't ask me how I got it. Uh, uh, perhaps the most, you can, uh, the most noted <laughs> example in, um, oh, I already said it. According to um, anthropologist Carrie Little Hirsch, a standard element of crossing the line is to have, quote, garbage, sewage, and rotten food poured over the wogs. Um, and into every orifice of their bodies, including their anuses. So, wogs is the term for sail new sailors, and this um, initiation ceremony kicks in uh, when new sailors are aboard ship and they're crossing the equator aboard ship for the first time. Um, Hirsch explains that wogs are also frequently required to retrieve objects from one another's anuses, initiating um, analingus. Similarly, military researcher Stephen Zeeland describes crossing the line as, quote, time-honored, officially sanctioned initiation ceremony in which sailors traversing the equator for the first time may experience cross-dressing, sadomasochistic rituals, and simulated anal and oral sex, and, uh, end quote. And in a third account, political scientist Aaron Belkin, uh, drawing on interviews and documents from Naval Academy investigations, uh, concludes of the late 20th century, quote, male American service members penetrated each other's bodies all of the time. They forced broom handles, fingers, and penises into each other's anuses. They inserted tubes into each other's anal cavities and then pumped grease through these tubes. Penetrating and being penetrated have been central to what it means to be a warrior in the armed forces. Some military practices construct being penetrated as the ultimate taboo others constructed as central to what it means to be a real man. So Hirsch, Zeeland, and Belkin uh, uh, agree that military initiation ceremonies, like crossing the line, re-signify homosexuality or homosexual activity as a hyper-masculine expression of endurance and loyalty. In the military, they argue, being penetrated takes on new meaning as it is imbued with the power to toughen up the male body and to put the male character to an extreme test. According to Zeeland, who himself is a former Marine, um, military logic suggests that men's contact with other men's penises and anuses is also necessary to build um, bonds among the troops. And uh, an interesting example of this was that military officials testifying during the um, Don't Ask, Don't Tell hearings in the early 90s basically said um, that one of the reasons that they felt it would be inappropriate for 
gay men to be in the military is that they might misinterpret um, the meaning of this kind of contact. They might actually think something gay was happening there. Um, and so that just wasn't going to work out because, you know, you need to have analingus in the military. So um, what I argue in my larger project is that, like most research focused on institutional environments in which white heterosexual men engage in homosexual sex, um, research on the military has tended to view this activity as a signal of the military's um, unusually complex and contradictory gender order, um, or its uniqueness as an institution that provides just the right material and rhetorical conditions for this um, to stage and justify these kinds of homosexual encounters. But when we look beyond the military, we find these same practices and logics in circulation. So this idea, this sort of only in prisons, oh no, only in the military, doesn't hold up because in fact um, we see this happening, this kind of contact between men happening in a range of settings that I describe in the book. Um, this idea that to endure abject homosexual penetration, to take it like a champ or a warrior, to surrender to blood, shit, penises, um, in order to demonstrate your allegiance to the group, um, to a male group, or display your masculine autonomy. All of these are tropes that circulate well beyond the confines of, um, of the military, appearing in fantasies posted on the internet, in college fraternities, in prisons, in straight and gay porn, in living rooms, in public bathrooms, in truck stops, and a range of other contexts. Institutionalized hazing involving rigid rules, homosexual degradation, and evident repulsion has been posited as a clear-cut example of extreme and sexualized bullying, wherein young men are forced to act out of accordance with their normal sexual impulses. But there is another way of viewing, of viewing hazing, not as a purely abusive practice that forces young men to stray from their natural sex, sexual constitution, but as one expression of the nexus of power and pleasure that undergirds heteromasculinity more broadly. Now, one case I focus on in the book is the 2009 investigation um, by the US Project on Government Oversight, or POGO, which uh, is, a, is a US government watchdog group. And in this investigation, they, uh, Pogo revealed that the young white American men privately subcontracted to guard the US embassy in Kabul, Afghanistan, were spending their leisure time urinating on one another, simulating anal sex, and eating potato chips from each other's anuses. Um, in some ways, this some example, I particularly like this photo, so I'm really bad. Um, in some ways, the activities of the embassy guards are indistinguishable from well-documented hazing rituals in the Navy, the Coast Guard, and the Air Force. And yet, in contrast, the guards um, uh, in, in Kabul touch each other in a more ambiguous context of their own creation characterized by ongoing parties and a general boys gone wild atmosphere. They are not soldiers, but employees of a privately uh, owned security contractor. <coughs> They're stationed at their place of work, which is the embassy, but then they party in their off hours at their base um, down the road. There's no evidence that the guards are facilitating initiation rites or conforming to any set of rules. In fact, they seem to be drinking vodka and eating potato chips from each other's butts to pass the time and for its own sake, you know, for the pleasure in it. <coughs> the images um, released with the reports, oh, sorry. Um, <coughs> Uh, are filled with smiling, drunken, mostly young white men wearing plastic Hawaiian lays, sitting in plastic pools and holding red plastic cups, a scene familiar to anyone who's been to a college party. And um, as the investigators themselves make clear, these men have little alibi other than their isolation and stressful working conditions. 
So the POGO report calls for an end to the, quote, lewd and deviant hazing behavior, end quote, of the guards, but it avoids assigning blame to them. Instead, it implies that the terrible circumstances, long hours, little sleep, poor working conditions, and isolation from home, are what cause these young men to lick each other's nipples while wearing red plastic Hawaiian legs. <laughs> um, Slavoj Žižek has argued that acts of torture committed by American soldiers uh, against detainees at Abu Ghraib cannot be understood apart from the American obsession with degrading anus-focused initiation rituals, which American men impose upon themselves in fraternities and elsewhere, and then extend to their enemies, who have no choice but to endure them. Zizek's analysis is a useful framework, I think, for considering the ways that performative humiliation and penetration are constitutive of white American masculinity rather than unusual deviations. The elements familiar to hazing scenes, dominance and submission, humiliation, filth, anality, and so forth, are not simply circumstances of aberrant bullying, but possibly desires woven through the very fabric of white masculinity. So um, I promised that we'd move beyond the confines of the total institution and into some less constrained environments. And so we're going to do that now with another site that I examine in the book, which is the casual encounters section of Craigslist Los Angeles, um, a social media site that I'm sure you're all familiar with Craigslist. I know it's like so uh, 2005 now, <laughs> the world of um, Grindr, uh, which certainly I would have researched now, except there's a new app called Bro uh, that certainly supports my hypothesis. It's for bros. Um, so anyway, in 2006, I collected and analyzed uh, 125 personal ads posted by self-identified um, white men seeking sex with other self-identified, I'm sorry, self-identified straight white men seeking sex with other self-identified straight white men. Um, and of course, this is the internet, so these people could be... Um, not straight, white, or even men, but what we do know uh, about casual encounters is that it's a site in which fantasies about straight, white, male sexual fluidity are being exchanged and which homosexual sex is being infused with heterosexual meaning, and I'm interested in how that happens. But I also want to say here, though, that there's actually good evidence to suggest that these men are precisely who they say they are. Um, uh, research by sociologists Hector Carrillo and Amanda Hoffman, which was published last month in the journal Global Public Health, found that 50% of the men who sought sex with other men on Craigslist identified as straight in their lives and in their face-to-face um, -face interviews with the researchers. Um, uh, even when asked, well, what about being, what about being bi? Aren't you really bi? These men um, asserted um, with confidence their heterosexuality, and 78% of these men were white. So though I didn't do um, uh, interviews with these men, other sociologists have begun to and um, support uh, uh, the argument that I'm making here. So in casual encounters, the homosexual sex of white men becomes heterosexual in large part by drawing on themes of white homosociality, or male bonding and friendship. Uh, and I observed this happening in two main ways in Casual Encounters ads. First, archetypes of youthful white masculinity, namely um, jocks, surfers, and frat boys, are presented in the ads as um, the paradigmatic everyman, as the most natural subjects of platonic male friendship. So the ads also employ various heteromasculine codes. Um, we're going to get together and drink beer. We're going to watch straight porn. Um, we're going to talk about women in their bodies, about banging bitches, and so forth. Um, uh, but they also specify a particular white male type um, that completes the heteromasculine scene. So I'm going to give you some examples of this from the ads I collected. Any, bear with me while I read these folks. Um, <laughs> any hot white jocks looking to get sucked off, I'm 23. Hey guys, I'm just a chill, good looking dude headed, headed down to the area for a barbecue and I'm looking for any other hot, straight, or bi white dudes looking to get sucked off. Just sit back and relax and get drained. I'm especially into sucking off hot jocks, skaters, surfers, and frat dudes. 
if you're hot and you're into a hot no strings blowjob, then hit me up. Uh, seeking a masculine jack off bud to straight porn, I'm 29. Hot masculine white dude here looking for another hot white dude to come by my place and work out a hot load side by side. <laughs> straight porn only, prefer straight, uh, surfer, etc. Not into gay dudes. And to see blowjobs or they engage in penetrative sex, but often they describe a desire for um, a more friendly side-by-side -side encounter, <laughs> exemplified by the concept of the jack-off buddy. Um, in casual encounters, heterosexual realness hinges on the believability of the homosocial motivation. Is this a gay encounter that might be infused with intensity, romance, or queer affect? Or is this the kind of casual, meaningless, physical contact that sometimes occurs between two dudes who are friends. Um, surfers are a particularly desired type. Now this is Los Angeles. Um, I would gather that the archetype would be different here in Austin. Um, but, but the point is that uh, the desire for the surfer is not likely due to the intention to actually surf together. Um, I think surfers are a particularly desired type because um, surfers, jocks, frat boys, all of these are being used to represent a kind of white masculinity that is perceived to be utterly normal, not queer. So the surfer, unlike the, um, the cop or the leather-clad biker, carries no association with, subcul with gay subculture. Sur surfer dudes and frat brothers are simply buddies um, in, in the universe of casual encounters. Um, these archetypes also signify a particular quality of relation between white men. So jo jocks and frat boys are not autonomous white male subjects. They evoke team sports and <coughs> brotherhood as much as they evoke individual personhood. And in, this, and, and in this sense, they refer to the institutional context, to the team, the fraternity, the university, um, <coughs> contexts that are imagined to facilitate, if not require, intimate contact between heterosexual boys and men. And what I'm getting here with this point is that um, institutional contexts like prisons, boarding schools, the military, have long been blamed for forcing sexual contact between men who are otherwise deprived access to sex with women. But in casual encounters, ads written by individuals who are completely detached from these institutions still evoke the institution as a way of demonstrating the heterosexual meaning of the encounter. So in other words, the institution becomes a rhetorical device that lends credibility to heterosexuality. And in some cases, this takes the form of a kind of nostalgic longing, as in this ad, what happened to the cool, bi, straight dude circle jerks? I'm 33. What happened to a group of masculine dudes just sitting around stroking, watching a game, <laughs> drinking some brews, jerking, showing off, swapping college stories, maybe playing a drinking game, and we see what comes up. Can you not feel this guy's pain? What happened <laughs> to those good times? Um, so this ad, purportedly written by someone who's 33 years old, refers back to an earlier time. Perhaps it is the time of youth or college, or perhaps it's referring to a particular decade of the 80s. Well, I guess for him it'd be the 90s. But in either case, it seems to want to remind the reader of a time in which homosexual contact was not about being gay, but was simply about being men. Um, now, closely mirroring the military narrative, the, the second way that whiteness appears in uh, the ads is in the form of a working class, um, sort of rebel without a cause, white masculinity that treats homosexuality as a kind of extreme sport. Uh, an opportunity to demonstrate one's physical strength and resilience. So here's an example of an ad in this vein. Straight fuck a guy in his briefs. Masculine man-to-man -man fuck, HIV negative only. Hey fucks, I need to fucking lay the pipe in some tight manhole today. I'm HIV negative, I fuck with rubbers only, I want to have a hot packing guy in some tidy whities bent over on all fours taking my dick like a champ. No femmes or tweaking P and P. That's brain play, dudes. I hate that shit. Only 4:20 in a hot pack and butt. Hit me up with your pics and your contact info. So white male friendship takes a less um, relaxed and casual 
uh, form in these sorts of ads where sex between dudes is described as a hyper-masculine, man-to-man, daredevil behavior to be endured like a champ. Um, in fact, uh, many of the ads I collected suggest that only real men could actually handle what's being offered here. Um, and though white male friendship does not completely fade from view in these types of ads, it takes the form of facilitating one another's endurance, um, more similar to, to the, uh, the framework and operation in the military. You know, you're, you're kind of helping to, in a way, you know, toughen up um, the male body through this practice. And this is a good segue into uh, my third example, which is uh, representations of straight white male homosexuality in popular culture. So it turns out that men posting on Craigslist are hardly alone in their representation of the links between homosexuality and straight white male risk taking. Themes of homosexual risk and adventure are also evident in popular culture, such as the prankster genre of reality film and television. Um, this genre is arguably exemplified by the Jackass television series and the subsequent spin-off films by the same name, in which um, straight white bad boys engage in madcap, madcap, never say that word, stunts, often um, that involves travel to the global south and gratuitous dude-on-dude -dude groping, um, and, and sometimes this groping occurs between the white American stars of the show and then a seemingly confused native man of color. Um, and, and so there's this sort of interface between uh, or, or a humor that's playing on what, how, how American viewers will perceive that sexual interaction and then how the sort of um, um, global south other is confused by um, uh, that sexual encounter. The genre rests on the notion that idiotic and risk-taking white dudes, like jackasses, white daredevils, Johnny Knoxville, and Steve-O, will do anything for a rush or a laugh, including tricks involving their own and other men's anuses, testicles, and, and nipples. Um, in jackass, sexual contact between straight white men is again reconfigured as an extreme sport akin to placing one's genitals in the path of a hungry shark, which is one of the stunts they do in the film. Um, and so they frequently um, manufacture scenarios in which they need to be penetrating uh, one another, uh, to include the fingers. The films invite viewers to celebrate homosexual play among edgy white dudes who are so reckless that their homosexual behavior reads as a macho display of toughness and self-sacrifice, a homosexual sacrifice made for the sake of our entertainment. Um, in this vein, feminist theorist Judith Kagan Gardner has reflected on the massive popularity of the television show South Park among straight white men a show centered around anus jokes and homosexual plot lines. Gardner observes a shift from the anal retentive masculinity of the early and mid 20th century to an explosive anality in the late uh, 20th century brought on by a media culture that encourages increasing amounts of male passivity and conformity. Um, Gardner makes a compelling case that young white men can maintain the appearance of defiance and autonomy in the face of this onslaught of um, prepackaged corporate media, simply by consuming <coughs> television programs like South Park, uh, in which this celebration of the male anus and its, and its excrement is offered up as a kind of populist rebellion. So it becomes, um, you know, South Park gets marketed to young white men as um, a, a, an act of resistance. Um, that to simply to simply watch it is an act of resistance because it is um, uh, wants to view itself as so countercultural. Um, I think Gardner's analysis is helpful again in in that it points us to uh, points to the ways that the orientation toward anality, the grotesque, and the homoerotic is not a departure from normative heteromasculinity but among its central ingredients. It's, it is um, at the core of what we now recognize to be straight white male culture. 
Um, now, while Jackass, the Jackass series has a kind of populist, working class resonance, I also look at what we might understand as its middle class counterpart, which is the trope of homosexual contact for the sake of white male art, uh, adventure, and bohemianism. Um, in the independent film Hump Day, written and directed by Lynn Shelton, two straight white dudes and best friends from college decide to do something radical for the sake of art, which is to bone each other on campus and use our, on camera, I'm using our language. Since college, Ben, played by Mark Duplass, who's on the left, has married his girlfriend Anna, bought a house and a car, gained some weight, and is living a respectable middle class life in Seattle. And Andrew, played by Joshua Leonard, here on the right, is an artist and an adventurer, freshly returned to Seattle after a um, long stint of, quote, making art with the locals in Chiapas, Mexico. Um, he is ever the hipster with his, like, his beard and his fedora um, and, he, and his tattoos, and he shows up um, at Ben's house and like, just disdainfully surveys his boring um, life. Now, Andrew, although he's also um, straight identified himself, he finds Ben's life and heteronormativity in general to be suffocating. And yet the film suggests that Andrew has little intrinsic material from which to craft an alternative. Like many a young white bohemian before him, Andrew resolves this dilemma through travel and cultural appropri appropriation. In addition to making art with the indigenous people of Chiapas, we learn that he spent time um, researching uh, herbal remedies in Machu Picchu and flirting with a princess in Morocco. <laughs> These allusions to indigenous and or exotic ways of life establish Andrew's bohemi bohemian credentials and they set up viewers to understand his reasons later in the film for agreeing to a dare that he have sex with Ben on camera and submit to the film to an art festival. Ben agrees too, being unable to bear Andrew's characterization of him as, quote, locked up, ball and chain. So, um, has anyone seen this film? Okay. Um, <laughs> as, maybe at my hotel room we could all watch it. Um, as the two men endlessly plan and discuss how the sex will play out, they compare having sex with, uh, with each other to bungee jumping and trekking through Bhutan. They detach uh, their homosexual sex from its identitarian associations by explaining that it will be beyond gay. They imagine a new kind of sex that they call straight ballin, which looks less like gay sex than it does, again, like an extreme sport, a character, birding, a character building hurdle, a foray into foreign territories where few straight white men have dared to go. While the dominant culture may construct gay men as pussies, Andrew and Ben rework the association between bravery and homosexual penetration. They decide that pussing out means failing to face one's fear of bungee jumping or homosexual sex. So in Hump Day, the possibilities for homosexual desire are intertwined with a white middle class bohemian and imperialist ethos that not only compels white male adventure seekers toward cross-racial and cross-cultural encounters, but homosexual exploration as well. Okay, so to conclude, to wrap up, what I find um, in this project is that homosexuality, at least rhetorically, is a ubiquitous feature in the lives of white, in heterosexual white men's lives. It is not incongruent with heterosexuality, it is part of what produces heterosexuality. So homosexuality, even if only as a specter, is part of the lives of all men, but white men in the U.S. have some particular tropes to draw from to help situate themselves outside of the pathologizing gaze of popular science, the gaze that is applied to men of color. For white men, homosexual sex builds male bonds, it builds male bodies, and it even bolsters national security, as we heard from um, the U.S. military. So what are the three main points that I hope you will take away from this talk? First, we have not focused enough attention on the vast array of sexual activities that take place under the banner of male heterosexuality. 
if we are to believe the significant but relatively invisible body of research on male sexuality or male sexual fluidity, we find that acts of kissing, touching, jerking, licking, and penetrating men are not limited to gay and bisexual identified men's lives, nor are they limited to desperate uh, situations in which straight men are denied access to female sex partners. I don't think any of us would characterize a fraternity that way, for instance. Um, in fact, these activities appear to thrive in hyper-heterosexual environments, such as fraternities. Um, what sets these scenes apart, um, these scenes of um, homosexual encounter between straight identified men and those that we might call uh, points of contact or contact that we might call gay, is not the specific sex acts, sex acts involved, like male fingers and male anuses, but the cultural narratives that circulate around these acts. Second, it is precisely because male and female heterosexuality incorporate many kinds of homosexual contact that we want to push back on theories of exclusive sexual orientations and hardwired sexual natures. From a queer perspective, the major flaw in the bioevolutionary science of sexual orientation is that it purports to study how people become heterosexual or homosexual as if it is evident what these terms mean. But taking seriously the ubiquity of homosexuality, not gay identity, but homosexual activity, raises some very basic but still unanswered questions about precisely what or who we are looking for when we look to the body for evidence of congenital heterosexuality or homosexuality. And last, while male heterosexuality in particular draws on the resources of white privilege to circumvent homophobic stigma and to assign heterosexual meaning to homosexual activities, um, uh, masculinities of color quickly fall subject to categoriza categorizations like the down low. Um, I want to be clear that my aim is not to suggest that we shouldn't incorporate white men into the down low, into constructions of the down low. Instead, my aim is to suggest that we extend to all men, both white men and men of color, the possibility that their sexuality is as fluid as women's, number one, but that it's also shaped by both structural and cultural forces, a complex interconnection, not just for men of color, but also um, for white men. So I'm going to end there. Um, thank you very much, Professor.